To become a high level leader in an engineering consulting firm, you need to have a lot more than just leadership ability. You need to interact with people, build relationships. You also need to maintain a good relationship with your HR team. In this week's episode of the Civil Engineering CEO, I am thrilled to have with me Rich Human. Rich is the president and CEO of H2M Architects and Engineers. Rich started his career as an engineer and has worked his way up to the highest level of leadership. And he's gonna share some great tips on all of these things for those aspiring engineering leaders out there. But first, a word from our sponsor. Before we go on here, I'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, Tensar International. Check out Tensar Plus, the award-winning design software for construction professionals to design with geosynthetics and calculate their value on projects. Tensar Plus is simple to use with a powerful engineering system at its core. Whether you're designing a crane pad or need to build a temporary road over muck, the cost, time, and carbon savings can be calculated making comparison with alternatives simple. Whatever you're working on, Tensar Plus is your toolbox for success. All right, now I'd like to welcome our guest on to the show for today. Rich Human is the president and CEO at H2M Architects and Engineers. Rich, welcome to the Civil Engineering CEO. Uh, thanks, Anthony. I'm really uh, happy you invited me and looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, for sure. Same here. And kind of to get us going here, Rich, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your company, kind of your location, the services you offer, a uh, number sure. of employees, just some some ideas for our audience. Sure, sure. So we are in our 90th year, uh, celebrating our 90th anniversary. Uh, we've got uh, about 525 employees. We uh, are a multidiscipline design firm. Uh, all the engineering disciplines and uh, architecture, probably 120 plus uh, architects and uh, MVP, civil, water, wastewater, environmental, you know, kind of one stop shop here. Um, we are essentially in the Northeast United States. Uh, we do have uh, a number of offices down in Florida. Uh, one we opened uh, last year and a couple we opened up this year. Uh, we're, we're principally located in Melville, New York, on uh, Long Island, about uh, 30 miles outside of New York City. Um, but we have locations in New York City, uh, two in the Lower Hudson, one in Troy, uh, one in Northern Jersey, one in Central Jersey, and an office in, in Pittsburgh, uh, and an office in Windsor, Connecticut. Awesome. All right. That yeah. sounds great. And, and, you know, I think that's an interesting, and we may get into this a little bit, but when you have a firm where you have, you know, architects, you have all different disciplines of engineers, it's certainly, like you said, it is a one-stop shop. Um, and I think it's an interesting mix of professionals kind of all under one roof, which I think has, I'm sure some opportunities that you can kind of bring to the table and we can get into a little bit. Um, but before we do that, let's just get a little bit of a background on kind of your career journey. I know you started out with an engineering degree. Now you're the CEO. So tell us a little bit about kind of your journey along the way here. Yeah. So uh, I started working at h when I was a freshman in college. So I, I was an intern uh, in 1987. So my whole professional career has been at H2M. Uh, I, I cut my teeth in water resource engineering. So uh, my career you know, a, kind of a typical staff engineer, project engineer, project manager, uh, became the chief water resources engineer. Uh, and then, you know, probably about 12 years ago, moved more into uh, a corporate role uh, where I was the, uh, the the president chief operating officer in 2012, uh, before becoming the CEO in 2013. So I'm in my 11th year as the CEO. Um, and I think that for us, you know, I'd said earlier, we're a 90 year firm. Uh, our first client in 1934 was uh, the South Farmerdale Water District. And uh, so our, our company has really been rooted in water resource and sanitation engineering. So for me, you know, to be able to have a career in, in drinking water, uh, not only was it rewarding and fulfilling, but in terms of my ability to ascend and aspire at H2M, 
uh, it was it was kind of like a natural connection because our company was so committed to what we did in water resources, really gave me a chance to uh, touch all the parts of the organization and be able to develop some internal relationships that, um, you know, frankly were critical as I kind of transitioned from the technical role into the corporate leadership role. Yeah, that's interesting. And I actually want to ask you a little bit about that because I think a lot of engineering professionals who, you know, might be listening to the show, they kind of aspire to become leaders in their companies, you know, obviously starting out with the technical background like you and I did. Um, and then, you know, maybe at some point along the way, they say, hey, I want to become a manager. Maybe they start in project management and so on and so forth. But for you, you know, you mentioned around 12 years ago or so you had the opportunity to go in like corporate, you know, leadership. Talk about that opportunity for you. Was it something that you were kind of, you know, desiring to have for a while? Is it something that came up and then you had to make a decision? Take us through kind of that transition process. Yeah, it was that was it was really interesting because at the time I didn't really know what was in store for me, uh, but the prior CEO knew. So what he started to do is he started to put me into places where uh, I was really transcending the water resource discipline and getting myself involved in some of the various markets and some of the other uh, design disciplines at H2M. And, you know, now, in retrospect, uh, you know, he knew that if in his mind I was going to be the person to succeed him, he needed to get me to branch out my experiences here at, at H2M. Uh, so it, it and it's funny because it's something that has stuck with me so much where, uh, you know, I've got a decade plus left, hopefully knock on wood in, in my own career. Um, but I'm already taking a look at other people here because um for, for me, now we've only had uh, you know four present CEOs in the history of our company. Wow. Uh, so you know the, the the you know the the sustainability and consistency in in leadership here has been so stable, and and I think one of the reasons why we're a successful organization uh, that I now have an obligation to you know kind of take a lot of the same approach and style that John Malloy used. He was our former CEO, John Malloy. Um, and, you know, utilize that as I'm taking a look at how I see the company transitioning forward. Um, so I, I, I was probably, not a probably, I was somebody who, if you gave me something to do, I would want to be the best at it, you know, mm -hmm. work harder than anybody else, put in more time, be more dedicated. You could ask me to, you know, vacuum the rug and I would, I would vacuum the rug. And I think John saw in me, um, this commitment to do whatever it takes and uh, was leveraging that in having me get involved in some other things. And I just embraced whatever he asked me to do. Uh, so I don't necessarily think it was aspirational. I think it was more, I was demonstrating myself along the way mm -hmm. and he knew something for me that I didn't know for me. Um, so then once he put me in, in the role um, of the president COO, it was kind of like a natural transition. You know, my big challenge was now to evolve all the relationships I had because John essentially, I'll say, skipped a generation here. Uh, you know, we we had a, a number of senior partners that had been here for you know ten or twelve years longer than I had. Um, but you know, I I I think he he saw in me uh, what he was hoping for in the next person to lead the organization. Um, so even people that I report was reporting to at some point, you know, we're now going to be reporting to me and how was I going to navigate uh, a lot of the challenges that mm -hmm. would, would go along with, you know, really changing up those relationships. Yeah. You know, there's some really important points there for those of you that are, you know, maybe do want to ascend within a consulting firm. I think one of them being, you know, it's not just this idea of whether or not you're a good manager or a good leader. It's to Rich's point, it has a lot to do with relationships, I think, and relationship building, especially when you work in a firm with a lot of people, a lot of different disciplines. Um, like you said, Rich, you were kind of challenged to kind of broaden your knowledge within the firm and around the firm, right? The different types of services, the different, you know, probably different people there. And I do think sometimes that you know, you may not think about this if you're working, you know, let's say like an engineer who, hey, I want to get into project management and leadership and then maybe eventually really climb up the ranks in my in my firm. 
Um, like it is important, the relationship building aspect of that. I, I, right, Rich? Am I, am I, am I right there? hundred percent. hundred percent. I think that uh, building yourself along the way and making sure that you are able to be really adaptive in how you behave. You know, it's something I talk about with our, our employees, especially our new employees that come here, we, we have a, a quarterly new employee lunch and, and I get an opportunity to meet our new staff and talk to them about H1 from my point of view and what my expectations are for them. And uh, we always talk about the fact that you're, you're rarely going to be successful alone, but you can always be successful as part of a team. So, you know, you'd be working on one project where you're a team member. You need to, to find the right role in order to really contribute. And then the next project, you could be managing the project. So your role is different. So, you know, even during the course of people's professional development, understanding what your role needs to be to best contribute to the success of the team is vital. Um, I think that's a challenge for most people. I, I think most people um, don't, you know, you know, perhaps have the the comfort and confidence to say, you know what, I'm okay with just being a team member on this one. Even on the last one, I was managing the project. But if you do, people are watching. And and I, I think for me, that's something that I would always show is, you know, whatever part of the team you want me to play, you know, I'm good with that. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. And And I think that goes a little bit back to the point that Rich made earlier around you know, you have to kind of also put people in the right seats, right? And understand who's on your team and who can do the right things. Kind of like the former CEO, did you say his name was John Malloy? Or? Yeah. 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 That John maybe did with Rich and identifying Rich as someone who could be a leader in the firm and then kind of cultivating that and helping him along. I think in any leadership position, that's definitely a responsibility that's not easy to do. I know I'm doing that here at EMI now too, is just looking at the team and saying who's kind of best where and what do they want to do and kind of matching those things up, which is a really big component of leadership. Yeah, sure. So you've been in this position for a while now, and I'm sure just in leadership positions in your career for some time. Uh, if I were to ask your staff, Rich, what your management style is like, how do you think they would respond to that question? I, I would think they would respond, you know, I'm I'm very supportive. Uh, I am not a micromanager. Uh, however, uh, I have no question about inserting myself if I feel the need to. Mm. And when I do, I... From my perspective, I'm not inserting myself because I'm the CEO. I'm inserting myself because I think I can help and contribute. And I try very much to, you know, really exhibit that kind of a behavior so that I'm not coming in just because I can and, and just because I'm the leader, but I'm coming in as somebody who has experiences that maybe the rest of the private team doesn't have. And, and I think I can I can help. Uh, even the people, you know, on my executive team that that report to me, uh, you know, we've we've got our whether weekly, biweekly touch bases. Um, I, I am absolutely accessible. Uh, people can come in and and um, talk to me pretty much about anything, and and I'm never going to shut them down if they come in and say, you know, do you have a minute? Yeah, I guess there could be circumstances where the answer would be not right now. Uh, but I would say the overwhelming uh, majority of time, I say, sure. And I'll put aside whatever I have going on and, and I'll sit with, with people. Um, I feel like if, if you are caring and empathetic and, and, and always trying to put people in the best position to be successful, uh, odds are they will, uh, and allow them to do that, allow them to, uh, when the opportunity presents itself to you know be successful, uh, I'm a big fan of giving people credit. Uh, I rarely take it, but I will always give it. Uh, I thank people all the time for the work that they do, and um, you know if, if nothing else, I I believe that all the goodwill you could build up in your people is going to put them in the position to best commit themselves to you when you need them. Uh, you know, you, you, you don't need everybody to be operating, uh, you know, at the greatest level all the time, but there are times where you need people to really step up and be committed. Um, and I would hope that, you know, if you asked anybody that 
I manage, you know, so, you know, what would your reaction be if, if Rich called you up and said, you know, Hey, you know, we, we, we got it. We have an issue and I need you this weekend. You know, I would hope that they would say, you know, where and when, and then they would jump in. Yeah. No, that's great. And I think Rich really highlights one of the biggest challenges in leadership really, which is knowing kind of how much to put your foot on the gas and how much to, to lay off of it. Um, I think a lot of leaders, they're leaders because they're driven, they're able to get things done. Like you said, Rich, you'll dive in and do the best you can at whatever someone asks you to do type of thing. That's what you aspire to do. But then when you get into these leadership roles, you kind of have to inspire other people to do that. But sometimes you might have to jump in, but sometimes you might have to say, hey, let them run with it a little bit. Let's see how this type this goes. I think that's a big challenge. Um, and it sounds like you know, you've know you worked hard to kind of have a good balance at that. So like you're saying, you'll get involved if you feel like you have to, feel like you can contribute, but you're also okay with kind of sitting back and letting the team run with it. Have you found for you that that's something that you've kind of had to work on? Because I know for me, it wasn't that easy to do, you know, to kind of step back. I'm, I think I've gotten better at it, but it's definitely challenging. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's no doubt. Definitely have to work on it. Definitely have to get used to it. Uh, you, you've got, you have to have confidence in your people. Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, for me, I have different levels of confidence um, based on everybody. And I look at everybody, you know, in, in, um, their own way and, and, you know, their strengths and weaknesses are going to be unique. Um, so there are some people where, you know, I, I can let them go, but you know, the rope is not going to be as long. Uh, I need them to check in with me a little bit more. And then there are others where, you know, we, we agree that something needs to, uh, you know, to, to be resolved or taken care of. And, you know, I know once it's done, they're going to come back to me and say, it's done. Here's what I did. And, in almost every circumstance, I would agree and, and say, you know, that was that was the proper way to to, to, take, to take care of that. And those are the things that I, I think is, as leaders are definitely most challenging. And, you know, if, if you couple that with the personalities of the people that we lead, you know, it's one thing to have your own perspective on, uh, you know, how much flexibility should you give, you know, people that report to you. Um, but then understanding what's going to motivate them to be successful is going to vary from person to person to person. So, you know, you really need to kind of, you know, bake that in and, and understand, uh, you know, not only from your own point of view, where's your level of confidence, but from their point of view, what are they looking for from you in terms of your support and in terms of your uh, involvement in, in the things that they do uh, and, and no doubt challenging, but I think for me, yeah, you know, since I've been at it now, and and my leadership team is very stable. Uh, there's a very strong understanding between us, and I think that's all very positive. Uh, there's no doubt that in the beginning it was rocky um, because at the same time I was evolving my relationships. You know, I'm now dealing with people in a different way, and I have my thought on how things should be done, which is different than the former CEO. And now, how do I, you know, at the right pace? you know, start to evolve approaches and, and things that we're doing as an organization without, you know, having it seem like I'm coming in, just stepping on the accelerator. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And, you know, it's, obviously that's a big transition for a firm, right? When you change leadership like that, and e even if it was done in the best way possible, right? People are different, different mm -hmm. ideas. But just going back to one of the things you said, I think it'd be interesting to flip it around a bit in terms of, like you mentioned, like, you know, some people can maybe have a longer leash, have a little more confidence in them. For those listening that are kind of aspiring to be leaders in their firm and they want a longer leash, right? Like maybe they're, they don't have the confidence of their leader yet. Like, how do you, how do they build confidence like in themselves from their leader? Is it just their performance? Like, what would you recommend to them? So clearly, uh, being able to apply judgment, you know, we all have our experiences and we have to um, apply judgment based on our experiences. We have to be decision makers based on our experiences. Um, we can't be afraid to make a bad decision. I think that that is, um, you know, probably one of the more fundamental elements of why people can't get the longer rope because they are, are afraid of making a bad decision. Mm -hmm. So they'll always want to come back to the leader to get confirmation. And I have people that work for me now where 
I've said countless times to them, your instincts were right. You know, you knew it needed to be done. You don't need to come to me. You know, there are certain decisions that I would like to be a part of. There are others that I don't need to be a part of. But that's your judgment. You know, you need to, you need to understand where that is. Talk to me as much as you want if you need to get as much clarity as as you can have in order to decide, uh, you know, when you need to pull me in and when you don't, that's fine. Um, but I would much prefer people making decisions based on the right information. Uh, and then if the decision ends up being not the most effective one, be, you know, very willing to uh, pull in myself or others to assess it. If we need to go in a different direction, then let's, let's agree. And that's okay. Um, I, I would, I would, I would much prefer that um, than people who are um, either unwilling to make the decision or when they do, unwilling to recognize that maybe it wasn't the best decision. Uh, so, you know, for people to be able to apply the right kind of judgment and the right approach to decision making, uh, those are the people that I think get the longer leash. That's great. And, and really what it sounds to me is like, if you want your leader, your supervisor to have confidence in you, you need to have confidence in yourself. Because to your point, Rich, they're not going to make a decision on their own unless they're confident in themselves, which kind of leads to the next step. Undoubtedly, for sure. Yeah. All right. So another thing I want to ask you about is, you know, we've obviously gone through a lot the last few years just in the world, let alone the industry with COVID. And, you know, there's things going on in our industry with all kinds of infrastructure funding and lots of projects, just a lot going on. And, you know, you as the leader of the firm, everyone in the firm is kind of looking at you, right, for your leadership. And when something happens, like, oh, you know, how's Rich going to respond to this type of thing? So I'm just wondering, like, how a leader you know, when you think about that, like, how do you maintain not overreacting, not underreacting, kind of being as even keel as you need to, to deal with these types of things, but also make sure that your staff, again, is just kind of, you know, confident or feels good when they hear you. Cause you know, kind of everyone's kind of maybe hanging on, on what you say. So I'm just curious <laughs> as to how you approach that. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, you hit on a couple of kind of major elements there and, and I'll talk about the, the pandemic first where, you know, we, from just a business perspective, not even our industry, uh, we were one of the really early firms to get back in the office. Um, I got people back in the office in, in June of 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that I I, I got a lot of um, you know third hand criticism for that, and but I explained to people why, and I'm very transparent and. Um, I can always be criticized and 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 I can handle that and I can defend why I'm going to make certain decisions. But you know, in 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 the face of great uncertainty, I didn't have the answers, right? Nobody had the answers, but uh, you know, leadership needs to be able to be in a position to let people know that the you know the ship is steady, <laughs> even though I didn't have any answers, right? And we were all reacting literally daily. And and you know, you know Liz in my office and uh, you know, she and I were were joined at the hip, you know, literally 24-7 as we went through it. Um, and my my communication with the with the staff was um we're gonna take all the steps we need to to make the work environment uh as safe for you as as we possibly can. Uh we we believe we are most successful when we are working as a team. Uh, I, I had you know many conversations with people about um, you know productivity of of remote workforce and you know from the beginning until today there's no way we were as productive during the pandemic as we are when we are present. Uh, I thought that then. I think that now. Uh, I feel as though uh, you know leaders in in our industry uh, were maybe you know trying to you know nicely paint uh, the fact that working remotely was no big deal and, and we could be just as effective at it. And, and I just don't think that's true. Um, so, you know, those are the things that for me were, um, were challenging. Um, and as you said earlier, it, it clearly we had to react and uh, 
in most circumstances, whether you're going to over or underreact, you're not dealing with such a, a significant issue as the pandemic. Um, so, you know, things that I were doing, things that I was doing could easily have been um, perceived as overreaction because mm -hmm. decision making was so significant then. Um, but in the end, you know, and, and, and I lost a few people, people that felt as though I didn't care about their health as much as I should. And I had individual conversations with people to say that just wasn't true. Um, but if that's really how they felt um, and they decided to go, then, then, then they left. I would say the overwhelming majority of people, once they got themselves back into the office, felt they felt good. You know, it, it, was, it was getting themselves back to being normal again. Um, and in my opinion, the longer that we would have waited to get back in the office would have just kind of exacerbated how long, you know, this whole, in, in my mind, it's still hiatus, even though we've embraced um, a remote work policy here. And, and, and we have a lot of folks that are remote. Um, I want the remote strategy to be on our terms, not on somebody else's terms, which, which we we've done here. Um, so I, 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 I absolutely look at myself as somebody who takes in information, has conversations. Uh, I will engage a whole group of people and in the end, let them know that when I make a decision, I'm making a decision in the best interest of the company and our people. Um, and you might not agree with my decision, but you have to at least recognize that uh, I'm not making a decision just because it's based on my own experience, I'm making a decision based on, you know, a, a, you know, almost a consensus approach to getting, uh, you know, lots of people's feedback, but, you know, I have a, a responsibility here in the organization to make decisions. So uh, it, it's, 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 the whole topic is very interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Something that, you know, when you, when you're an early on leader, it's very like, if I, if the pandemic would have happened when I was in my role, after two or three years, right. there's no way I would be able to handle it like I handled it after being in my role for for nine years. Yeah, no, that that's that's I, I could see that really in any stage of one's career, right? The more experience you have, especially at these leadership positions, I think things I don't know that they become easier, but you've done them more, right? So you have that experience, and I think also to your point. As a leader in any organization at a high level, like it doesn't matter what you do, like not every like there's going to be people that disagree with every one of your decisions because there's just so many people involved. So, you know, you you can't really you kind of have to block that out a bit. And like you said, just really have conversations, get all the information you can, and then you ultimately have to make a decision. And then you can certainly back it up and defend it, but you know you can't be making decisions scared and that, Hey, I got to try to please everybody. Cause just, it's just not going to happen. I mean, there's just too many people involved at that level. So um, I think that that's a good approach in terms of hearing people, but ultimately, which kind of, kind of honestly goes back to what we talked about a little bit before is like, you know, people, you need to be confident in yourself as a professional, get the information and then make the best decision that you feel is best for your team, whether you're just managing a team of like 10 people or for the, the company, if you're kind of CEO type seat, right? A lot of that comes back to your confidence, which I think is just a really important career theme, quite frankly, right? Because Absolutely. everything that you're doing, I tell engineers this all the time. I tell them, learn how to do public speaking, even if you never have to get up in front of an audience. Because what I've found is that one of the things that public speaking helps you most with is your confidence which is then translates to like every aspect of your career and life, quite frankly, because, you know, when you get up in front of people over and over, you just get more comfortable with yourself and you, you know, you get more confident. And so it seems like that's, you know, more or less becoming kind of a pattern here or of some of the things that we've talked about. So Rich, I had the opportunity to facilitate a panel that you served on uh, back in January and you talked a lot on that panel about the importance of the CEO working closely with the HR team within a consulting firm with some, which again, you know, some of the stuff we just talked about with COVID and other things, I'm sure was, you know, more than ever that that was the case. So can you talk a little bit about your kind of philosophy around that and how you kind of foster and maintain strong and consistent relationships between yourself and, and your HR team? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great point, Anthony. And, um, you know, <laughs> I, I, I got a lot of guidance from John as, as he was, part in the organization and um you know the the he had two 
you know, almost non-negotiable pieces of advice. And, you know, one was try to stay involved with clients and projects just so, you know, that nobody can come up to you and talk about something that, uh, you know, you don't have a strong sense of yourself. So be engaged, which was great. And the second was stay really close to HR. Uh, you know, it wasn't stay close to finance. It wasn't stay close to IT. It was stay close to HR. And and I did. Uh, and and over the years, it's um, it's been so valuable for our company because, you know, as a as a, a professional services firm, and um, you know, our success is is always going to be based on our ability to uh, sell and have our clients buy our experience and our expertise and 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 it's our people. Um, and you're going to get a perspective from HR that is um, different than the, 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 the business perspective you're going to get from most other people. Mm. Um, and it's not that HR doesn't understand the business at all. It's just that, uh, you know, the way HR perceives value in the organization is always going to be about how successful can our people be. And it's so aligned with my thinking. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, if you, if you're always doing the right things, the bottom line takes care of itself. You know, I don't start at the bottom and look my way up and try to figure out, you know, how do I squeeze and how do I, I, I pull things out in order to make the bottom line strong. You know, I, I make my focus on the top line and, and make sure we're doing good things. And so much that goes into between the top and the bottom line is going to be how well our people do. Mm -hmm. You know, even to the point, and and um, uh, you know, I, I know you know Dan Ritchie in our office. Uh, yep. When Liz and I were talking about hiring a learning and development manager, uh, you know, we had this conversation going for probably three years before we hired Dan. Um, and then I can remember having conversations with other CEOs at some conferences about the fact that we hired this person, and um, you know, their reaction was immediately overhead. And I said. Time. I first of all, I rarely use the term overhead ever, especially when I'm talking about our our corporate administrative departments here, because you know, overhead implies unnecessary. It implies um, uh, just excessive. You know what? You don't really need it. And if you needed to go ahead and and take a look at your business, you know, squeeze and consolidate your overhead. When you have you know five hundred plus employees and you know your 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 hundred million dollar company, you know if you don't think investing in your people is the way it's going to make your company most successful, you're not paying attention. Uh, so, you know, here's somebody who we bring in uh, who doesn't like he understands our industry a little bit, but he's not from our industry, but he knows how to identify uh, opportunities to develop people. And uh, coming in the door, I think he was viewed by our leadership team and our engineers one way. And uh, not too long after that, he was viewed de very differently as somebody who was bringing huge value to us. Uh, and, and those are the kind of things that I think in the past, Liz would not have pulled the trigger on because, um, you know, she's, you know, she's, she comes from, you know, the, the world of H2M where um, I'm not a, big risk taker, but um, I'm a conservative risk taker. I'm very willing mm -hmm. to take risks. I think before me, we were just a conservative company. Uh, and at that time, I don't think willing to do some of these things that are are intangible in the value and the contribution that they're going to have. Um, and to me, moving forward, uh, and, and any suggestion I would make to any other CEO is, um, you know, if, if you get overly influenced by finance and um, you know that ends up completely overshadowing HR in my view you know that's that's you know short term and potentially compromising long term you know we we get our p ls every month and we have to react to those every month and do things every month but if you're constantly reacting to you know just the finances you're gonna miss, uh, all the other pieces of what make your organization successful. And, you know, for me, 
our, our HR team is aces. Uh, I, I rely on them heavily. I give them uh, a lot of flexibility. I give them rope. I empower them. And, and I would make that suggestion to anybody. Yeah, that that's great. And one thing that that Rich said that I think the way you framed it out, Rich, is a good way to think about it. And yeah, I don't always often hear this from people, but when you have a services firm or you're in a services industry, you don't have a product to sell. So, you know, you're selling services and your services are executed by your people, which lends the point that you made is that, you know, your people are everything. I mean, they're the ones, you know, delivering the services, interacting with the clients. So an investment in them is really investing in your ability to drive value and serve your clients. Whereas, you know, if you're in a factory making widgets, yeah, you could practice your process and get the process better, but that's not the case in our industry, right? It's all around people and their interactions and how they relate. And, you know, we're up against this a lot too, because, you know, we do learning and development at EMI. So if we go to a company and we're talking about learning and development, we kind of get that same idea like, oh, well, geez, how many hours is it going to take away from their utilization if they have to go through this program? In fact, I was talking to someone about this recently and that, that kind of that saying came up, which is like, you know, well, what if we spend all this money and we invest in them and then they go somewhere else, right? It's like the flip side is like, well, what if you don't invest in them and they, they stay with you, right? So so it's always the back and forth. And yeah, I know Dan there now and he's great. And it seems like he's brought in a really good learning and development perspective to H2M, which is awesome because I just think that in the world we live in today, like in this infrastructure industry where all these projects are getting more complex, they're getting faster, you know, for your people to keep up with that, they need to develop themselves, right? They need to have someone helping them on how to deal with people better and interact and project management, whatever the case may be. And it's kind of like, if we keep going faster, but we're not taking time to kind of make sure all the parts and all the people are, are working well, something's going to break. Like, that's what I kind of tell people, right? It's like, something's going to go off the tracks at some point. And so... Um, I think it's great that you're thinking in that way and that, and it sounds like that relationship with HR is what allows you to really have that focus. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and a little, little bit to the point you were just making, um, you know, I've seen here uh, probably over the last three or four years, a, a little, a little bit of a separation where whether it's investing in people and making sure you're developing them. Your, your whole point about, um, you know, the, the, the balance of taking people away from the utilization is that, I mean, that, that's a critical conversation with your, with your resource managers and your leaders, because um, you need to be able to do both. You, you, you can't, you're not going to sustain yourself if you're overly focused on one or the other. And what we try to do is, um, message our people in a way where it's about building value in them and the company. So, you know, yeah, if you invest a lot in people, can they go someplace else? Yes. Um, but, you know, when they're with you, they're going to continue to elevate their form, their performance and their effectiveness in doing what they do. Uh, and, you know, too often the, um, the professional development gets sacrificed. Uh, we, you know, we take a look at all of our people, uh, depending on their position here, what their role is, and and you know try to allocate time for them every year to go ahead and do whatever appropriate development is is um, going to go ahead and and really contribute to the elevation of their value. And they get it here now. I I, I think for a, a, a while um, there was clearly a difference of opinion, and managers if they could. You know the 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 nose of the grindstone. You know, hey, if 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 my employee could never pick up her head, and it's just billing projects, like she's great, I'm great, I look great. Well, the one time she picks her head up is when she's going to tell you she's leaving because she can't yeah. take it anymore. Uh, and you know what a miss that is. So I I think that you know this whole conversation about um, you know how do you commit time to people to develop and at the same time make sure that they're working on their projects is um, it's, it, it's one of the most conversa most important conversations I think managers need to have with their staff. Yeah, for sure. And you mentioned before, like the idea of risk taking, which I think is a good way to think about this. Cause I do think a lot of people in our industry think that sometimes investing in their people can be risk because utilization gets reduced. You know, like, like I said before, what if you upskill them and they go somewhere else? Right. But I think like you have to be able to take some risks in your career, in business to be able to grow. 
And so I don't think it's it's I don't think it's a risk investing your people, but if there are people out there that think of it that way because of the utilization, I would say it's it's a risk worth taking because the alternative can be very bad. And you know, you may have to give up some utilization time, but like Rich's example that he just gave was perfect. If someone's got their head down, they're churning away and they're doing, you know, 95% utilization week after week or more, you know, they can't sustain that. And they're not going to want to sustain that. And most of the times when we talk to people in this industry, they want to go to a firm that invests in them, invests in their development. And so I think all those things are important, which is kind of leads me right into kind of the last thing I wanted to ask you about, Rich, which I know you also talked a little bit about on the panel when I got to, to see you in the panel was, you know, talking about culture, because I think it's really baked into what we just talked about quite a bit. But the idea of company culture is such an important thing you know, and how people interact with each other, you know, the the kind of philosophies I think that leadership have and, you know, interacting with people. Like, how do you think as as the CEO of H2M, how do you think about culture? And, you know, how how do, how do you work on it, if, if that's the best way to ask it? Yeah. Um, so when I took over as the CEO here, I would consider our, our, our culture at the time was, you know, we were coming out of the Great Recession. Um, we were fortunate enough to be a company that didn't have to lay off resources, but you know we were kind of flat, and it, it was a struggling time. And we we had really kind of recoiled ourselves. And when you're in that kind of a mode, um, it's very difficult to focus on culture and. Um, because you're so concerned, you know, once you start introducing elements of culture, um, you know, you don't know how people are going to respond to that. You don't know where that's going to, it, it actually introduces, uh, you know, less control from a leadership perspective because you're trying to now instill in people the ability for them to, you know, behave the right way independently and to use the right kind of judgment independently. Um, and I would say in the, in the first few years, I worked very hard and focus very much on establishing H2M's culture uh, to the point where, um, you know, to, to look at us today, uh, I'd mentioned earlier, our, you know, I have a new employee luncheon every, every quarter. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I do is I talk about our, our mission, vision, and values. And I talk about mm -hmm. what they are from my point of view, but I encourage them to, uh, as they gain experience at H 2 M to make it seem something real to them, how would they see, you know, what the H 2 M way is? How would they see what doing the right thing is? Um, you know, those are are they're personal. You know, you you can't legislate that, but you need to create an environment where everybody's behaving the same way, and when they do, especially if you're a new employee you get involved in the culture that is very healthy and well-established and, and you fit. Um, you almost can't not fit. And if you're somebody that doesn't fit the culture and we hired you, the likelihood is that either you're going to decide to go or we're going to decide to help you go one way or the other. Um, and I, I've, I've often talked to employees about um, how important it is for them to be committed to the company, be committed to our culture, committed to our values. And if for some reason they're not, come and see me because uh, I want to help them get a new job. As much as I love people here and, and as a growing organization, you need to always be bringing in new talent. Um, the talent's got to be the right talent. And, and you don't always make the best decisions when you hire. Uh, and hopefully those things, they surface and, and you can see what they're all about. Um, but for us here, and for me personally, I feel like it's probably the most significant influence I have in the company is the culture. You know, not my technical expertise as a water engineer, not my, you know, I've gone, you know, through leadership and business experiences. It's, it's really being true and committed to our culture. Yeah, I think that that's 
that's really, really critical. And a couple of things that Rich said, because I know sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around culture and how to improve it, but there are things you can do. And I think Rich gave a couple of examples. Like I think just an employee, new employee luncheon, for example, would be a culture building activity. I mean, obviously you can talk to them about the culture in that call, but even just getting, introducing them, getting to meet them. Um, I think that's, that's a big deal. And I think looking for ways like that to build culture is something that um, it's just something I think that people need to pay attention to and you actually have to work on it. It's not something that all oh, the culture will just kind of play itself out as we grow. No, like it's actually something you have to work on. And I agree with Rich that the CEO and the leadership of the firm has influence on that. And it's, it's a critical, critical component. So lots of stuff there. That's probably a whole other conversation we could keep going on with, but it's, uh, <laughs> but it is a critical and fundamental piece of growing a firm in, in the world we live in today. Like I, I've been saying throughout we live in stressful times in our industry. There's a lot of positives, a lot of opportunity, but that also means that there's a lot of work that needs to be done and people are working very hard on a daily basis. And I feel like the culture can help you think about, I know at EMI, what we try to do with the culture is think about how can everyone work a reasonable number of hours each week and have a personal life? Because if they have both, they're going to be happy people and you know they're going to want to work with each other. Whereas if people, everyone's working maxed out every week, it's just not going to work out well in the long run. So lots of stuff there, lots of stuff that we unpack. Once again, Rich Human. Rich is the president and CEO at H2M Architects and Engineers. Rich, I really want to thank you for spending some time with us here on the Civil Engineering CEO. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure, Anthony. Good stuff. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Rich. He really unpacked so many important aspects to leadership in the engineering world. And one of them really being that relationship building that's so important as you grow within a multidisciplinary firm. And also that relationship with HR that he talked about is critical and I think will get more and more important as projects get more hectic and our industry just gets busier with all the infrastructure work to come. Please consider subscribing to our channel here. We put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.